it's, it's very special um, to be here, um, uh, both to be with all of you, uh, but to be here with Dr. Barry. Um, there's, no, uh, uh, there's no smarter, uh, more committed um, individual uh, that uh, when you're dean, and I don't wish that on any of you, um, uh, when, you, when you get to be dean, you, um, you get the privilege of um, having uh, relationships and, and getting to know uh, faculty, um, and um, they're very special. Um, and certain faculty um, um, stick out um, in, 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 in your mind. Um, and um, Michelle is, uh, is one of the more... Um, certainly one of the more memorable, and when she wrote and said, would you come, th th there was no question. Um, um, so, and welcome to you to be, how long have you been here? Uh, about 19 months. 19 months, months. two months. Um, the, uh, I assume multinationals is multinational corporations, yes. right? as opposed to um, other multinational uh, institutions. So we're, let's assume for the moment we're a multinational global food company, right? and uh, pick a year. Um, say this is 10 years ago, uh, and, we, and we're one of the largest multinational global food companies. What's our business plan? Let's see if we can do this right here. So come up with a business plan. What's our strategy? So what's our goal? Buy, buy cheap, okay. Sell what? Sell a lot. Okay, at, at the highest price. Everybody agree with that? Well, depends on what kind of business you But what's my objective? What, what, what do I have to do? What's, what, what's my fiduciary responsibility? What? My, is, uh, I care about st my stock price, right? And in order to care about my stock price, what do I got to do? I got to maximize profits, okay? So if I got to maximize profits, I got two choices, right? What are my two choices? I can maximize my revenue, right? Or I could, I could lower my costs, right? And so we're a food company, right? I mean, what's the business plan? And we're global, right? And we're, we make highly processed foods means what? What's in my food? What? High fructose corn syrup. What else? But I, not a lot of people buy high fructose corn syrup. Okay? Right? So, so, so what do I need besides the high fructose corn syrup? Okay, to get to this. Preservatives. <laughs> high fructose corn syrup and preservatives because I want to do what? I want to ship this over... Oh, I want to ship this over long distances. Right? So, but what else do I need besides high fructose corn syrup? Yeah. Fat. What kind of fat? What kind of oils? Okay. So, so, so I, I have cheap fats, I have high fructose corn syrup, I have preservatives. What else do I got to be able to put uh, in these? You bought this. You, you, you can pass these around. <laughs> right? We'll, we'll get to these later. Just put them around, anyone. Right? What? Fillers. Fill, fillers. Okay. And, but what's our strategy? Anyone could do that, and everyone else has done that. What's our business plan? We're going to make it taste good? Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to uh, uh, add flavors. I'm, I'm going to visual appeal. Okay, what else am I going to do? We're global. What? Well, what, 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 what's our business plan? Make people, want it. Make people want it, okay? How am I going to do that? <laughs> Make it taste good. Make it cheap. Yeah, but, 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 but okay. Show what? <laughs> Show famous people eating it and looking satisfied. The, uh, create, an response. create an effective response. How am I going to do that? <laughs> okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to, I wouldn't do that, would I? So I'm going to increase, so, so I'm, just a little salt, okay? 
So, uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with the food itself? Easily accessible all the time. Easily accessible, right? What does that mean? Anywhere, anytime. What does that mean? I mean, I used to eat when? Right. So, so the business plan is to take fat, sugar, and salt, right? Make it so that people want it. Make it super stimulating. Add fat, sugar, and salt. But I want to make it accessible anywhere, anytime. But, you know, I, I, do I have to eat anytime? When do I need to eat? What? When I'm hungry. <laughs> when I see food. What, when I need to eat. How much do I need to eat? Well, I mean, what I, I average person, 2,000 calories, right, over a 24-hour period, probably need, what, during waking hours, no more than 200 calories a day, uh, an hour, right? But your plan is what? You want me to eat more whether I need it or not, right? But you're going to do that how? By serve, well, is that going to save you money or not save you money you on your cost? What? Make it look you're going to make it look bigger, but it, you can't make it look bigger and it's not bigger. You can use more cost of goods or not less cost of goods. We've got, we've got to come up with a plan here, okay? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is, you know, we've got to have a business plan. We're going we're gonna to take fat, sugar, and salt. We're going to make it stimulating, right? We're going to uh, make it uh, uh, attractive. And then we're going to do what with it? We're going we're gonna to put it on TV 24 hours. And where else are we going to do it? What do you mean make it addictive? What, 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 what? There's a substance that's addictive? Is there only one substance that's addictive? Wait a second, wait a second. Is, wait a second, is, is that part of your business plan? Wait a second, wait a second. I mean, in the boardrooms of the major multinational, are people sitting there and when we talk about, they talk about their business strategy saying, we're going to make this more addictive? You think there's any corporation that talks that way? Yes. You have any proof of that? What? What? I interviewed the food scientist. And, and, and what did they tell you? They didn't tell you anything. <laughs> And I'm going to make this accessible 24-7, right? Because my goal is to get what? My goal is to sell more product and get people to do what? Buy it all the time, whether I need it or not, right? So, so if you look at the business plans of the, ma the major multinationals, right? It's, it, I mean, if you look privately, it is... You know, certainly make food highly stimulating, right? Make food cheap, be able to ship it over long distances, but make food highly accessible. The major goal has been distribution, right? Uh, accessible 24-7. Uh, and market the hell out of it. Widespread accessibility, widespread social acceptability. Okay? That's what's been going on over the last 10 years, okay? That's the business plan. Let me tell you how I got into this, and then um, the interaction when I got called into the boardroom of a major multinational and what I said to them and what they said to me. But I didn't realize what was going on in the, is the business plans. Right? But these companies have had business plans. Right? Let me tell you how I got into this. As Michelle said, like Barry said, I did tobacco. I'm sitting in my office at Yale, minding my own business, just very interested, um, not in obesity, uh, not in food, uh, interested in a very different question. I remember sitting here with a group of residents and fellows and, and asked the question, if you want to stay alive, what can you do to stay alive? What are, what's the evidence-based literature on, um, on prevention? And... Uh, I started asking that question, 
And a funny thing happened to me that this was before everything was online, that one of the librarians at Yale was helping me pull the evidence-based literature, and I noticed that she, she lost 30 pounds uh, while she was doing it, right? Because, I mean, as a clinician, we, we all know the weight's not good for us, but if you really look at the three leading, you know, I mean, three quarters of us are gonna die from either cancer, cardiovascular disease, or stroke, right? Three quarters of the population. And if you, you, you look certainly what the, you know, one of the major determinants of that is, I mean, it's excess calories, right? So, but then I started going, okay, if it's excess calories, what's changed? So I called my friend Catherine Flagel, and I said, um, she's one of the great uh, epidemiologists at CDC. So here is age, and here is weight in kilograms. And you never plot data like this, but since she's one of the great epidemiologists, I'll let her get away with it. He, so this, I said, explain to me weight over a lifetime. How has it changed? Right. So here is... Um, Back in the 1960s, NHANES won. You'd enter your adult years. You'd gain a few pounds, right, between your 20s and your 40s. You'd basically stay flat, um, and then you'd lose a few pounds in your senior years. Weight was relatively stable over an adult lifetime, right? That's in the 1960s. Here's the 1970s. Here's the 1990s. Here's 2000. Okay. So what's changed? What's happened? You keep on gaining weight throughout your adult years, certainly much later, but what do you notice on these graphs? What? You start you, so you, where do, where's the weight gain occurring? Right? Before this period, you enter your adult year about 18 pounds heavier. Right? It can't be genetics, right? because genes don't change in three, four decades. And so I was very interested in what was driving those curves. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is uh, overweight, um, this is obese, the percent of population, um, and uh, with the exception of Mexico, the rest of the world is looking at us and saying, we don't want to look like them. And who's the them? The them is us. I mean, it's Americans, because we certainly lead here, um, uh, again, in, in overweight. But you can see that the rest of the world um, is, is certainly following um, uh, to a significant uh, degree. Right? And these changes have happened over the last three, four decades. Right? So the question is, what happened? Right? Why did you see those changes between the 1960s uh, and 2000 over the last three, four decades? Because if you look, we didn't have a problem three, four decades ago. Right? You know the term set point? Right? What, what's set point? What's a set point? In med school, right? We used to learn there was a set point. What is it? So it's a biological point where if you, you know, somewhere in your brain, somewhere in your body, there's a concept of homeostasis that if you reach that set point, you stay at that set point. And so I don't lose, reason, uh, I, diets don't work, is if I lose weight, right, I gain it back because there's a set point. Well, if that were true, we wouldn't be getting bigger and bigger, right, if there were a set point, unless there was a set point only at one end of the equation. I'm watching, I'm at Yale, it's, um, uh, the night, I'm, it's late, it's at night, I'm surfing through the channels, and I'm watching um, the daily rerun of Oprah. Right? And I still remember there is a woman on the, the set, there was a Dr. Phil segment, don't get me started on Dr. Phil, the woman comes up and says, I eat when my husband goes off to work in the morning, I eat before he comes home at night, I eat when I'm happy, I eat when I'm sad, I eat when I'm hungry, I eat when I'm not hungry. And then she looked in the camera and said, and I don't like myself. So 
and I'm sort of listening, and I'm trying to listen as a clinician, as a physician, and saying, what am I hearing? What's going on with this woman? So I want to understand what's going on with those curves, those graphs, and I want to understand what's going on with that woman. Why was this woman doing what she didn't want to be doing, but she was doing it anyway? So scientifically, not, having nothing to do with the industry yet at this point, I try to just try to understand what's going on with that woman. What's driving that woman to do what she didn't want to be doing? Right? Let me give you four or five pieces of the science. We'll put it together, and then we'll go into the boardroom. Okay? First piece of science. In the presence of a varied and limitless diet, animals and people will tend to eat excessively. That's the first hypothesis. In the presence of a varied and limitless diet, animals and people will eat excessively. How do I know that? This is the work of Tony Sclafani and Peter Rogers. Right? The simplest of experiments. You take animals in a cage from birth, you give them lab chow, and this is their weight gain, the early part of their life. Add to that cage what's called the supermarket diet. Right? What's it in the American supermarket? Take crackers, uh, uh, chips, chocolate, bread, put it in the cage, right, in a, le in a limitless way. This is the weight of the animals. Take away that supermarket diet, and their weight comes down, doesn't come all the way. Okay. So in the presence of a varied and limitless diet, animal and people will tend to eat excessively. Second piece of science, right? What drives wanting? Not liking but wanting. The vanilla milkshake. What's in the vanilla milkshake? Sugar, there's fat, there's flavor. Which one drives wanting? Right. Which one, what is wanting? Right. It's the motivational component. Right. How do you measure that? Right. In animals, you, you see how hard an animal will work for it. Right. How, well, they'll press the lever. So you make a, an animal press once, they'll get the food, then you make them press a multiple, so it's two times or four times before they get it, or, or eight times or 16 times, or 32 times, or 64 times, or 120. So you see what the break point is, <coughs> how hard they'll work, right? Or how, in, you can do it, uh, an experiment with, uh, with people, how, how much will they pay, right? I mean, they're, they're, um, uh, for it. So how many of you think, what's the major driver when you do the experiment how many think it's the sweetness that's the major driver um, for wanting? Raise your hands. About 20% uh, of you. How many think it's the fat? Uh, about 30, 40% of you. How many think it's the flavor? Nobody. How many think it's all three? Sweetness is the main driver. But when, you, in fact, you add fat to it, it's synergistic. So, next piece of science. Right. I said to my colleague, Gitano Di Cieri, one of the great pharmacologists I mean, in the world, Gitano did this seminal work back in the 1980s that um, showed that all drugs of abuse, heroin, morphine, cocaine, um, all stimulate brain dopamine. What does brain dopamine do? What, what does dopamine do? What? Reward. Pleasure? Actually, it, it, uh, dopamine probably has more to do with attention focusing and learning and gating of attention. So it's linked to the opioid circuitry. But dopamine affects um, whether it, it gates my attention, it focuses. And what Gitano found was back in the 1980s was all drugs of abuse elevate the dopamine circuitry. And that's, that's really the main driver of addiction. It's the ability to, to elevate brain dopamine and the, you read any textbook, uh, drugs uh, of abuse can elevate brain dopamine. Food gets your little bump in brain dopamine, but the second and third time you habituate to it. So food didn't do it, drugs did it. I said to Gitano, let's take fat, sugar, and salt, right, and feed it repeatedly right, um, to uh, animals and measure brain dopamine. So you're going to condition the animal with, brain, with uh, fat, sugar, and salt over a repeat period of time, and then measure brain dopamine. And what you find, in fact, is that if you don't give it repeatedly, you don't get brain, you get a little bump in brain dopamine,
but not the second and third time. But if you repeat it, and this is the nucleus accumbens, you get it each and every time, right? Brain dopamine does not uh, decrease. Okay. So the fact is that fat and sugar, fat and salt, fat, sugar, and salt stimulate intake. This is the work of the late Ann Kelly. These are, these are the, I just show this, these are the learning memory habit and motivational circuits of the brain. Right? What are those circuits? I mean, they are not circuits just for food. Right? So food works on which circuits of our brain? They work on the learning memory habit and motivational circuits. Right? And so why won't a drug for a diet ever really work? Well, it'll work. It'll affect on those circuits. But what circuits do they have to affect? The learning, memory, habit, and motivational circuits. Right? And the problem is they're not selective for just food. Right? You, you need that circuitry for other things. So any drug, I mean, amphetamines will work, reduce appetite. But it'll also, you have to give me back a certain number of IQ points because they're affecting the learning, memory, habit, and motivational circuits that we use for other activities other than just eating. Last piece of science. Okay. Last piece of science. Um, that woman on Oprah. What was I hearing? What was I hearing from that woman clinically? Right. She said, I eat when I'm happy. I eat when I'm sad. I eat when I'm hungry. I eat when I'm not hungry. Right. And I can't control myself. She could certainly control herself. She was conscious. But she felt like she was living in inner torment. Right. Food was calling out to her. So what I was hearing was a loss of control, a lack of satiation, a lack of feeling full a preoccupation of thinking about food between meals. Or when you're eating something, you're thinking about what you're going to eat next while you're eating that. Or there's that pizza box and there's one slice left. What are you, you know, you're thinking, am I going to get that slice? Right? So these three characteristics, loss of control, lack of satiation, preoccupation. So we did the epidemiology uh, with my colleague Alyssa Eppel and Mike Akery, and we found that 50% of people who are obese, 50% of people who are overweight, 20% of people who are at healthy weight score very high on those three characteristics. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but if you extrapolate in this risk of extrapolation, that's some 70 million people. Right. So if you have, uh, you have this sort of you know, constellation of characteristics, right? is it a disease? No. But you have people who feel, who feel and all, you know, millions of people, who feel that they have a hard time controlling their eating. So then what we did is we, with Dana Small, uh, a colleague, we, I wanted to understand what was going on in, in those people. Uh, and what you see is we had to do the experiment in, in two phases. Okay? We took people who, have, who score very high on those three characteristics. And how could, you notice I said 20% of those people are healthy weight. How can you have those three characteristics and be healthy weight? Who are they? And they're restrained eaters. Who do they tend to be? Higher socioeconomic women, right, who are conditioned, right, who have all those characteristics, but they've learned for social norms and other reasons, right, to compensate for, for their eating, whether they're living in inner torment or exercising. Ever, they still self-report those, those characteristics. But what we did is we wanted to understand people who scored very high on those characteristics. Why do people feel like they have a loss of control? And just where does the power of food come from? It comes from what? Power of food comes from taste, smell, memories, right? Um, I did, here's uh, Chip Kidd um, did this cover. Uh, I didn't realize, he's one of the great graphic designers. His books are just his covers. Right? It's not a pitch for the book. But um, what grabs, if you understand this cover, you understand the neuroscience of eating. Because right? here is what? You see there's a piece of carrot cake and there's carrots. Right? What grabs your attention? What do you look at? Right? When you see this, what grabs your attention? Right. Which, which stimulus is salient? And what we found, so the power of food comes from the anticipation. Right? And in fact, wh where does that happen as far as neurologically? In the amygdala, in everybody, cues 
I mean, the emotional response. That happens in all of us. Okay? But what, you, what we find is there's excessive activation okay, in people who have this conditioned hypereating in the amygdala when you cue them. And when they start eating, it continues to, um, you see this excessive ad, uh, activation in the emotional response in the amygdala uh, when they're actually eating the food. So there's a biological correlate to um, that conditioned hypereating. Right? So you tell people who have a hard time eating, right? you show them this, and they go, I've always they've sort of have known this, right? but there is a, um, you know, all of a sudden they go, you mean it's not my fault? There's a reason why that stimulus has become you know, so arousing um, so salient that it can activate, it literally it's stimulating their brain and once you activate that amygdala, what happens? You have this increased attention, increased focus, um, these thoughts of wanting. You try to stop it and you know, that's the stuff of cravings. Right? So let, let me just see if I can just put it together. Right? Um, so um, I get called to, so we did the science. And then I get called to one of the multinationals. So I get flown to London, first class, and they say, what's going on? Okay. And I start talking to them. Right. And it's quite clear that this is their business plan. Right. Take fat sugar and salt, put it on every corner, make it available 24-7, um, make it socially acceptable to eat any time. That's their business plan. So then I show them just a couple of slides. Right. I, don't, I don't go into all this data, but I basically say, look, we're all wired to focus on the most salient stimuli. It's the way our brains work. So if a bear walks in here, you all stop thinking about me, you start thinking about that bear. Right. If there's a fire next door, you start thinking about the fire. Right. That's, that's the way um, you know, our brains are designed uh, as a, a species. Palatable food becomes hot stimuli. The food industry has created food to be highly salient stimuli. Right? This is a, I was outed by the Washington Post. This is not far, far from you. I had to go dumpster diving. This is chilies. This is what's injected. This, isn't what, 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 this is not what is cooked on the top. I mean, this isn't the sauce. This isn't uh, what it's cooked with. This is actually what's put in the chicken. Right? In these big tumblers, some of the vacuum uh, injected, sometimes they're needled. So this is, so you, you look at what's added to the chicken. So it's orange juice, which is what? Lemon bar mix. What is it? It's triple sec. Soybean oil. Salt. Right? That's being added um, into the chicken. So what I'm sitting there and I say, food is designed to achieve a remarkable salience or prominence in our minds. That individuals are vulnerable to cues and stimuli. Those cues and stimuli create urges and thoughts of wanting. Cues activate the brain circuitry that guide behavior and the behavior becomes rewarding and self-sustaining. And then I said to them, right, they're, all, they're all in suits. Um, let me, let me give you an analogy to bring this point home. The similarities with the analogies, but there's also some differences, right? But I say it just so you understand. Nicotine. Nicotine is a moderately reinforcing chemical. Animals will work for nicotine, but they don't work that, it doesn't drive them to work that much for it. Right? But if you add the smoke, right, what, what did we do? We added the, the smoke, the throat scratch, the cellophane crinkling of the pack, the color of the pack, the image of the cowboy, the sense certainly in my parents' and my grandparents' generation that smoking was cool, it, it was sexy. What did we do? We took a reinforcing chemical and we made it into a highly addictive product. I give you a package of sugar and say, go have a good time. You will say, what are you talking about? Add to that sugar fat, add texture. Add color, add mouthfeel, add temperature, right? add, add heat. You know, put those chocolate chunks uh, in it. Put it on every corner. Make it available 24-7. Add the emotional gloss of 
advertising. Say you can do it uh, uh, with your friends. Walk into any food uh, mall in the United States. Walk, and, and what do you see? We're living in a food carnival. What did we expect to happen? Right? And your business plan was to, to make food highly salient, super salient, right? and to put it on every corner and made it socially acceptable. Up until uh, recently, the French have not, I was talking about the last hour, the French have not gotten fat. Why? Because they, they ate highly palatable foods, but they ate during certain periods of time. They had certain boundaries. There were certain controls. Multinationals moved in, and what did they do? They made food mo mobile. They made food accessible 24-7. They had uh, restaurants available, food available all the time. They changed the social norm. I showed the science. I made the analogy. There was absolute silence in the room. And then somebody quietly said, everything that made us successful as a company is the problem. Is the problem. Took fat, sugar, and salt, put it on every corner, made it socially acceptable, made us, you know, uh, so they were constantly being stimulated. Does it affect everybody? No. But it certainly affects enough people. I mean, people who, um, I mean, for whom that past learning and past memory, right, um, is able to capture and hijack certain parts uh, of uh, their brain. Right? Now you're that multinational. And then you say, all right, Kessler, what are we going to do? What do you advise us? And that was the, you know, in, you know, what would you say to them? <laughs> that diet's going to work? Why? Why aren't diets going to work? Sure, sure, diets will work for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. You could deprive yourself. But if you've not, I mean, once you lay down the new neural circuitry, if you've not, right, once that circuitry is laid down, you then go on a diet. But then you go back into your environment and you get cued again, what's going to happen? You're going to gain the weight back. So diets are not going to work. It'd be great if you sell diet books. You, you know, people will like, buy diet books because they'll never work. They'll have this cycle, but then they'll, uh, you know, the, the, nat the natural circuitry of being able to be captured by highly salient stimuli. What do you do if you're, you're a multinational? <coughs> You call it healthy. So, 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 so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this healthy or I'm going to sell healthy? I take it their goal isn't to decrease obesity. Right. So David, we invited PepsiCo to come. Along with me? Okay. So then ask him. Ask. So when are they? When are they coming? So 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 when, what? Come to that lecture. I want. I wanted to. So when are they coming? Can you give me the date that they're coming? Not next week. May sixteenth. May sixteenth. Thank you very much. So so if, so so ask him about Mexico. Ask him what part of the caloric burden in Mexico is due to soft drink. And what the, um, the average child in Birmingham, Alabama drinks how much sweetened beverage a day. Right. So Kelly Barnell, our colleague at Yale, right, has the, the, specifically has the soft drink industry in the crosshair. Because right. what is it? What are they selling? This, this, sugar water is not going to do it for you. Okay, so, so understand what do they sell? Understand how does it work? It's a multi-sensory product. It has the reinforcing sweetness, right?
but it, it, you have to um, uh, add to it certain other levels of stimuli. Kool-Aid will work for kids, right? Because kids like, you know, uh, one or two stimuli, but you tend to habituate. So you got to add, you got to make it a super stimuli. Add to the, um, the sweetness. It's not just sugar water, right? So you add carbonation. You add a mild pharmacological effect in the chemicals. You add the temperature, right? So you have a multi-sensory stimuli. Right? What's the social um, redeeming value? What's the nutritional value of it? So what's socially responsible about selling a product like that? Somebody makes the argument, please. People, well, uh, people uh, why do people want it? Sweetness works, right? It, it, it activates the amygdala. Right? Uh, I, you know, so, so I asked Rich Rawson, right? Sorry, this is going to sound um, inflammatory. I said, Rich, he's one of the great drug abuse experts down at UCLA. Said, Can you make me into a meth addict? Can you make me want meth? He said, absolutely. I mean, if I expose you to it, right? I said, no, 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 I can't, you're not gonna make, you can't make me into a meth addict. He says, I can make you into a meth addict. Okay. So wanting alone, right, is, is that the, you only give consumers what they want? I mean, PepsiCo knows that it's in the crosshead. I mean, the strategy of PepsiCo over the, uh, is trying to move away from the soft drinks and to diversify. It knows that it's probably, you know, time limited, and it has to, you know, they're now selling, you know, what percentage of their portfolio has moved away from soft drinks. Right. I mean, but Kelly has targeted, I mean, is a number of others in the public health community, soft drinks are number one. And they're not going to stop. And what are they going to do? They're going to, I mean, so, so how, how do you bring this under control? So, so, the, 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 so, so the first thing you do is what? I mean, what happened? If you look at PepsiCo's history, what did they do? What did they come out and support? What was the first thing they did? What? No. What, what, this is a problem about what? If we could all just what? What? Exercise. So all the exercise programs is just, just let's all exercise and then you can drink anything you want, right? So the food industry went there first, right? So, I mean, what I told, I said, look, you have a choice. I mean, it's coming. You, you're going to either be in the crosshairs or, you know, you can try to get a little ahead of it. I mean, is your, what's your obligation? What's your responsibility? What? Well, is that true? What's long-term shareholders, right? Or is, is that what a co corporation hides behind, right? Is that like well, what, what do you sell? What are you going to do? Well, you have to make a decision. You're in that boardroom, right? Juice is any better than... Uh... What about portion size? Can you decrease portion size? Is that, a, is that a public health good? All in favor of uh, uh, decreasing portion size? Raise your hand. Okay. And, then, and what, do you think, what do you think when the average consumer walks down the aisle and see decreased portion size? 
Does that mean, does that mean you're going to re reduce your price? You're, 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 you're in the boardroom. Diet what? So, so it's, it's sweetness that stimulates the uh, CNS. It's, it's, it has the same effect on, I mean, it, it's a sensory stimulus, right? When you do the same thing, what they did, they had a You're really that manipulative? That I'm going to buy two? I mean, I mean, I mean, some company, I mean, it's some companies that I've talked to, I mean, have really seriously thought about how do we build in speed bumps, right? So, so how, whether things are individually packaged. I mean, is there anything wrong with selling something that tastes good, even if it doesn't have any nutritional value? Dr. Barry? Well, it's not illegal, right? So, right? And, and people are going to buy it. Right? And I can make money doing it. Right? And I'm going to export this to where? Well, so I'm in, I'm in Durban. Sat, I'm, I, I chair the board of the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And I say to my colleagues, I'm just there on other business, and I say, what? I mean, I'm just looking around, especially the health workers, the lower lower paid health workers, and I see the obesity in Durban, and the, the answer from one of my colleagues was, uh, it's KFC. As soon as KFC moves to town, right, people use their discretionary income. Then I go up to KwaZulu Natal in the northern province, and I can assure you there's no KFC. Right? And the senior matriarchs of the family are what? They are big, right? Because they are culturally, that means what to them? That, that social norms, that's, well, that means what? That's, that, that's health, that's, I'm not infected, right? Um, I'm going to provide uh, stability. Then you go, well, how can you be obese and there's no KFC? And then you go look and you see they have, the, you know, the, it's called vat cake. So it's honey and fried dough. So they make their own KFC, in essence. Every society has, I mean, it's highly salient stimuli. Now the question is, so, so from a public policy perspective, let's see if we can agree on the legitimate role of government, right? And if we can't figure out what our responsibility is in the boardroom, full disclosure of what's in the product, everybody in favor, raise your hand. Is that a legitimate role of government? Not a legitimate role of government. Your colleague next to you. Trade secrets, right? But, but do you think it's a legitimate role of government to have this? So, so that we can agree on, okay? Um, education um, of, uh, in schools, is that a legitimate role of government? No. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But is a legitimate role of government, education, all in favor of that? But it's not going to work. What about taxes? All, what about taxes on PepsiCo? Let's take the vote, and then you can report back. All in favor of raising taxes on soft drinks, raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Why? Well, that's that's where, where the line is. I, I, there, there is, and how do those things get decided? Right? Lobbying? I mean, there will, there's no question there will be a soda tax. Okay? Now, PepsiCo may not want a soda tax, right? But what, do you think policy will drive that question? No. It will be when the taxing authorities need the revenue. 
right, uh, enough, and they have to find something uh, that they could tax. It's never the public health side that's going to drive it, but it will get there. Uh, so it is, uh, it is not uh, equitable, right? I mean, if I, you know, two cents to me is not the same thing as two cents to you, right? right? But is that the way the tax, sales tax system is based? In tobacco? Did we do it? I mean, did it work? Did taxes work in tobacco? Absolutely. Right? I mean, you, Philip Morris knew exactly what um, their... Uh, 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 the amount of sales would be uh, decreased. I mean, are public policy measures perfect? No. Right. Let's open up questions. Are we going to, I mean, what are we going to do about this? I mean, can we get out of this as a country? What's at stake? Is this some academic exercise? I was on a Personal responsibility, okay, right? So if I, just, if I just, you know, wake up and I control my eating, right, and I exerted some personal responsibility, problem will go away. How many believe that? Raise your hand. This is, this is a matter for the, this is, how many believe this is an issue of personal responsibility, primarily? How many do not believe it's an issue of personal responsibility? So, so what, what, well, what, what's, what's the downside about personal... Well, first of all, if my amygdala is being activated, and show you that, and now I'm a five-year-old, right? Do I have personal responsibility in this game? So who has the personal responsibility? The manufacturer or the parent? Both. The problem with the personal responsibility argument is a personal responsibility. Of course it's a personal responsibility. Can I, can I control my eating? Can I try to, just because my brain is being hijacked doesn't mean I can't try to protect myself. It may be hard, it may be difficult, my amygdala may be hijacked, right? Now some of my colleagues disagree with me. If you talk to Kelly Brownell, he will probably say, I mean, and others will say, you're living in a fantasy world, Kessler. You, you don't get the fact that once you understand that the brain is being hijacked by these food cues, and what the industry has done is put these food cues every 10 feet. You can't walk more than 10, 20 feet from here without having some kind of food or food cue. I mean, just look in the room, food cues are, right? So your brain is constantly being hijacked, right? And you expect me to protect myself at activation? And they say, unless you, Kessler, unless you change the environment dramatically, you are not going to be able to cool down those stimuli. What's the problem with, for, for, if you buy the personal responsibility argument? Certainly you can try to cool down emotional stimuli. Doesn't mean you're, you're captured, you can substitute other things. Parents can do it for their kids. What's the problem if we buy the personal responsibility argument? There's a couple caveats for me. Like, there's a lack of good education about alternatives. So even if I know things are, or I, I know things are bad for me, I don't know in particular what things are bad for me and what to avoid. You don't think the average person knows what to eat and what? No, I think it's very surprising how little people know. The second is just not having a choice in the first place. So distribution is monopolized by these. So, is, is this, let's go back to you sir, first and then get to the second. Is this a question of knowing? Is this a question of knowledge? In large part, yeah. But what part of the brain is being activated? The emotional core of the brain. And that emotional core of the brain, I mean, can I lecture you and tell you what to eat? Will that affect whether you respond, your amygdala gets activated? Social norms can have an effect on whether my amygdala lights up. Yes. I mean, so, so, so how, how did that work? 
What did we do? What's the example? Tobacco. What did we do? So, so a stimulus, a reinforcing stimulus, can either be positively or negatively valence. Tobacco used to be what? Positively valence. What did we do? We demonized the industry, right? We demonized the product. We made the product negatively valence. Well, so can I, but that's, can I demonize food? So you can't demonize, I mean, that's the stuff of the eating disorders, right? I mean, if I, if I demonize food, food has to be pleasurable. You, people need, need food. So the question is, can you do certain set? Can you demonize? Are we better off celebrating? I mean, which works better? I mean, if you're going to stimulate the effective core. I mean, so Alice Waters can sit here and get excited about a radish and say the radish is the greatest thing, and that'll stimulate her effective core. Or, or am I better off demonizing processed foods? The problem with the personal responsibility argument right, is that it, um, it, it can only go so far because it doesn't deal with the environment. And if the environment is set up so that I'm constantly being cued, you're not addressing that, that problem. Right? I, I, it's interesting. We, all, we hear a lot about personal responsibility. I, I, there's not a lot we hear in general in political terms about corporate responsibility. You had, you had another point. I cut you off. I didn't mean to. Uh, I was just going to say, even if you know what food you should be eating, it's very hard to find it. it is, uh, but, 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 again, but again, I know what I should eat. Yeah. I can assure you I know what I should eat, right? But I have suits in every size. <laughs> right? Knowledge alone is not enough. This is, I mean, th th I mean this really does deal with the, the effective core. Surely there are people with disorders of their emotions. Can we look at their uh, their weight, their response to these? Yeah. So so so. Can we have like overweight psychotic syndrome? No, but you have Clever Busey syndrome. I mean, so I mean, you do have certain uh, uh, syndromes. You have you have frontotemporal dementia, uh, where when those oh. where those links are broken and where the habitual behavior becomes uh, repetitive and they keep on uh, eating. Of course, of course. I mean, I mean, I mean so, 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 I mean, if you're the ideal, if you want to sell, sell the ideal product, what's the ideal product in this world? What? So translate. But, 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 what, what, but, but um, what do you want to trigger? You want to trigger no division of that. No, what, translate that into uh, physiological terms. Something with a dopamine high at the same time, or the second one at the same time. So I, I, I'm trying to get, to, and what is that? What's an addictive substance? Use the word addictive substance. What's an addictive substance? What, why, what makes it addictive? Well, uh, dopamine's a chemical, okay? Uh, right? So something doesn't chase you, right? Right. The, the, the hallmark of an addictive substance is something, something that, let's use the term rewarding, okay, reinforcing, right, is something that can change how you feel, right? So the goal of, I mean, if I'm going to sell something, Right? The most important, I mean, you look at most marketing and advertising next to a product, this, it tries to associate with some kind of experience that changes how you feel. Right? So something's going to make me feel better. Right? Something's going to allow me to escape. Something's going to, right? I don't, you know, I'm stressed. This is going to make me feel better. Right? So what do drugs of abuse do? Why, does, why do people get addicted? Right? They want to feel better. Right? Problem. Those, those circuits get hijacked by the drugs, and then they get cued, and then they get the arousal, um, and then they, they, get the intra, uh, they get locked into this cycle, so the drug is actually making them feel worse, and the, 
but they won't need the drug to in order to feel them, make them feel better. So, so what, what you want to do, the ultimate product, is something that's going to make somebody feel better right, at the effective core. And, it, and in the absence of making it somebody feel better, what do I do? I try to market and advertise, so I put toys in the food. Right? So there's something that, that, that I want that's going to make me feel good, even, and I learn to associate it with the food. Yeah. So, so, right, so, so just to understand how, it, so if you have past learning and past experience, right, you have to have a memory, right? You've had that, and that's made you feel good, right? That's given, and there's a pleasurable response, and something associated with that cues me, right? And then that cue stimulates, you know, certain arousal and attention, Right, and then and that's before I eat. That's just a cue, right? So I, I just see the ad, right, and I start thinking about it. I have these thoughts, right? Then I then I actually consume the product. I have this momentary pleasure, this this sort of bliss point. We don't quite understand that. Right? I mean, whether it's the end cannabinoids or the opioid endorphins or, or whatever the opioid circuitry. So I have this pleasure. The next time I get cued. I do it again, and every time I do it, I strengthen the neural circuitry, so I get, I get caught in this cycle. Is there any satisfaction ever? I mean, where's the dopamine? I mean, the dopamine's probably more associated with the cue, right? Do, do, do you think we think it's a serious problem? What? Not yet. Right? Do, do you have any doubts about the seriousness of it? Let's deal with the personal. Any doubts about the problem? By 2030, what's the number, what's the percent that will be type 2 diabetic? By CDC's numbers? A third. Right. Right. But, but you have people who make fun of the First Lady's efforts. You have, you have certain pundits, you know, who making fun of what the first lady's, right? She's basically pitch perfect, right? But she gets attacked because this is what? This is the national nanny, right? Do we all agree we want, I mean, not everybody in this room agreed to tax. What, what is not happening? Well, so, 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 so let's deal with the French first. Then you can, first of all, there's a dirty little secret which we don't want to talk about, right? Well, but the French smoke more, right? So at the end of the meal, the, given a choice between dessert or the cigarette, they want the cigarette, right? But, right? So but we won't talk about it. that. Because that's substituting one forcing behavior for another, right? But up until now, it's been the social norm in France. What kind of food do they eat? What do they want? They want real food, right? They want processed food. They would never eat the kind of food. The portion sizes we're eating are disgusting to them. They would never eat between meals. They would never bring anything into a classroom, right? They had certain boundaries. Those boundaries protect. Them. What did we do in the United States? What's been the business model? Okay? Taco Bell, what's the, what's, I mean, go back to the business model we agreed upon. What's the tagline? Support meal. Right. <laughs> so the business plan, yeah. right, has been such, I mean, do, do you have any doubts why, the, I mean, if you're going to take fat, sugar, and salt and put it on every corner and make it available 24-7 and make it socially acceptable to eat any time and make food into entertainment, what did we think was going to happen? Okay. The problem is, once you lay down the circuitry, once you lay down 
this past learning and past memory, and this, you have this cue-induced circuitry, right? And it's activating the, you know, the emotional core of the brain, and that's how it's working. Can you reverse that? So we just, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was on a panel, I think I said it, you know, with four diabetologists, I showed the data, and they basically said, we're toast as a country. How do you change that? Right. So the, que so, the, so the real question is, what you say to the multinational company, and the question is, is it true, you need to understand there are certain, what we see evolving, because it has to have the same degree of emotional response. If you're going to substitute something for fat, sugar, and salt, you're going to have to have something that can stimulate that amygdala, and people want it as much as the fat, sugar, and salt. Right? And so that's the stuff of people caring about something. So some people care about whether it's the ethical treatment of animals, eating organic, eating locally, eating real food. So the question is, is there a food movement? There's certainly many food movements that are occurring in this country. Right? And the question is, where's the social norm? Right? And I think, I think it starts, certainly, I mean, we're not America here. I mean, on, I mean, on the two coasts. Right? So you can't judge. <laughs> certainly, I mean, in the Bay Area, right? This is not America. Right? But th th there's certainly an increased emphasis I mean, I mean, you know, I just you walk down the streets of, uh, you know, major cities these days, and there are the places to get real food. I mean, are increasing. And so, the, I mean, if if we've effectively demonized, and the question is, do we celebrate the good stuff or do do we demonize the bad stuff, and which is more effective? The, the social norm. I'd be happy to stick around to answer any others. How do we, take a second question. How do you think about feeding the people who can afford meals? Right. The first question is <laughs> a little easier um, that, than the others. I mean, we all need to eat, right? Um, and uh, chances are, uh, I think what you see is that increasingly, and it still needs to be tested, people are willing to spend a little more of their discretionary income, certainly in other countries, for better food. Right? So, I mean, w what we're talking about is not the economy, right? It, it just may be changing who does the money go to. So where do I spend? Um, the, d the Democratic Party understands this. Okay? I mean, this is an issue of, um, they understand, for example, that you can't get, um, you can't become president of the United States unless you have a certain percentage of the rural vote. And who's the rural vote? I mean, I mean a lot of it is farmers, right? And I mean, in those farmers, right, so eating locally, right, eating real food, I mean, who, who where's, you know, the, the question is who's going to win and who's going to lose. I don't think the issue is hurting the economy. The, the, the second question is a much harder question. And that is this issue of real food is going to cost more than highly processed foods. Right? Because the advantage of the, you know, if you look what's happened in the 1930s and 1940s, in order to feed a hungry nation, what did we do? Right? We learned to process foods. So we learned to add, take uh, food, take water out of it, uh, add preservatives into it, increase shelf life, ship it over long distance, cheaper food. Along the way, we learned to dial in fat, sugar, and salt. The flavorists were able to make the stuff bad food even look good, right? We took out anything objectionable of the food so that, it, uh, so that we ate food without, it's nothing slow, we used to chew 20, 30 times per bite. Today, the food goes down after one or two, two bites. We're all eating adult baby food. I mean, it was the highly processed food 
has been designed so it's just we're self-stimulating ourselves. So we, we've made this processed food. We were able to make it very cheap, sell it over long distances. Real food is more expensive. Right? How, do you, how do you get to afford that? Right? Um, the issue is if I just keep on this treadmill, I, I'm not sure I agree with the premise right, that real food has to be more expensive. Because if, I, if I'm just eating crap all the time, and I'm just eating uh, um, it nonstop, and it's not satiating me, am I better off, I mean, you know, that bag of chips, and I, this, I'm just going to eat another bag of chips later on, or am I better off eating that orange that's going to cost more than that bag of chips? I mean, I think that real food doesn't necessarily, over the long term, have to be much more expensive. But calorie for calorie, it's going to look more expensive. Thank you very much.